administration for this. Um, so it's about depending on the direction is 10 to, to 20 hours depends on where they study um, the direction they have the people who are going to join the public administration and uh, it's, it's very funny how I got this I, there was a, a very active man a legend in, in the Greek third sector who unfortunately one day died and they needed to fill in the space, and they called me. <coughs> That's how I became a lecture <laughs> on, on this topic. Um, and it was, it was hard, it, it, it was it was very hard to fill in his boots, because he was a legend. I mean, he was the founder of the Greek part of Greenpeace, and, uh, and he, um, everybody knew him as a point of reference among amongst volunteers in Kitas Lunarakis. Okay, and um, so no one is an academic expert on NGOs. As I'm a political scientist by formation. Um, I have worked in the third sector uh, with uh, Bosnian refugees in the early 90s, and then as a peer trainer for human rights. Um, okay, and I think there's a part, when, when I see the word European, I, I, I think I have the challenge to see whether I can get you to see yourself somewhere there. Um, okay, I, was, I was born in London and I lived in Italy and the Netherlands uh, and the UK and here I am. Um, I might be migrating again, I don't know. Um, I think they are helping us these days to decide. Um, <laughs> But let me go on. So what am I going to talk about? What is the third sector anyway? I think I'm going to see different things than Barbies, and that's good. Um, how does it relate to Europe? And I mean the public administration in this case. And why should I care? Uh, and why should you care indeed? Um, well, you are from the third sector, but maybe why should you care of its relation with the public administration might be a better question. Okay. There are many definitions. There is no E definition. Um, usually the neither nor definition is mostly used. Neither public nor private, something in the middle. Uh, a political uh, definition is a quite an old one uh, believe it or not, it dates for at least since the 19th century. Um, so it's something between the government and the economy. And since we've seen uh, what Sky is doing with Kifisos, it's often a rebalancing act. The environmental impact, the market is going there. They are building over this river, and we don't have a river anymore. So uh, here are some public actions, and politicians will come and speak. And that's a good thing, because then they'll have to do something. Um, for services, no one will take on uh, help for the uninsured. Again, uh, a very nice example seen on, on the video. But I mean, um, if you go, I'll try to bring <coughs> global. Uh, if you think when time banking came, when, when, when did time banking flourish? You'd be surprised to know that time banking is flourishing in Greece, it's mushrooming in Greece. Nearly every third council is now starting a, a, a time bank. And uh, the most developed time banks in, in, in Europe are, are in the UK. And I'm now building a project with Times Bank UK, and they are handling, they have handled, they have 23,000 members and about a million point seven hours being a change. Why? Why did, why did that happen in Britain? Well, um, I just, so people can thank uh, what happened in the well, well, it's again the, the, the Iron Lady. I mean, she, she helped with a lot of things in the early 80s in Britain, uh, including Scottish nationalism and time banking. Um, a lot of people in the north um, had to have changed, had to live somewhere. It's, sometimes it's called the love economy. 
the economic definition, so love economy is the definition, indirect rather than direct profit. <coughs> well, I, I'm, not, I'm not very sure. I think what was described as voluntarism, i.e. I bring my kids because they need to learn other values than making profit, is voluntarism, it's indirect profit. Um, um, and, and, and it's a big sector. I mean, people advertise jobs that are not paid for. And many experienced professionals would take them for the experience. And sociological definition, um, investment in the social capital of the community. So art beyond the creative industry. Um, okay, CSI is very interesting. And, uh, and, 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 and lots of productions are very interesting, but you don't get experimental theater because it doesn't pay unless somebody does it on a voluntary basis. And then it can join and be mainstream in the creative industries. Lots of things have happened this way. Um, intentional communities. I mean, there are people who just live with each other because they can't stand others. That they are also part of the voluntary movement. And I mean, you've got vegetarians and you've got vegans, and that's one example. And um, sometimes it's a status statement. Philanthropists. Philanthropists are their name lives on now somehow. And they have their name in universities and hospitals. And that has some added value. It's indirect profit, in fact. Pressure groups. Um, the OECD uses the term social capital. So networks founded on common social norms which produce social benefits. So. I, I go back to what Babis was saying about localities. But the point about networking is that people do not need to get together unless there is an added value on them coming together. And that's the basic rationale of many EU projects. And you just, every time you write an application, you have to think, OK, why leave southern Ukraine where you work with people that um, have gone through Chernobyl, because that may be valuable know-how in Japan at the moment. Nobody has tapped on it. Here's a project idea. Ukrainians could teach a lot to the Japanese. Usually goes to the rich, teach the poor. And we forget that in Greece, we could learn a lot from Bulgarians and Albanians on how they dealt with their own crisis in the early 90s, which was called, sorry, uh, uh, the very nice word, transition. <laughs> yeah, and Moldova, they had a transition and in Georgia, which entailed losing 80% of their GDP. It would make Greece look like a party. <laughs> how they dealt with it is a know-how we could use. Um, cultural capital comes from Boudier. Um, cultural capital is an exchange of symbolic goods that seem rare and valorized in a specific social context. What does that mean? It means I have a PhD and I can address you as an authority. <laughs> Doctor. It's a um, symbolic good that seems rare and is valorized in a specific social context. In Europe. Okay. Part of the issue that public administrations have with citizens is that they need to be organized in order to see them. They have to have a legal entity somehow. Um, unless, how, how, how can you deal with citizens? No, you, you need a structure of some sort. And they start dealing with that in the 80s in the Council of Europe. Because it's hard to speak about human rights or have a human rights agenda without addressing citizens at some point in time. Um, and the UN started dynamically integrating citizens' groups in conference, consultative status, and dissemination of policy. Um, also because they need to say that um, 
yeah, we are very far from the people, so we need we need to somehow to legitimize that we are doing things with the people and for the people. And since nobody votes for UN representatives, you, you need somehow to engage them. Um, so public administration that does not go into this voluntarily. We have, the public administration always has ulterior motives and as they are as ulterior as NGOs. And um, it's a good thing to have motives. It's just that they need to be transparent. Transparency. Do you see the fat cap on the corner? <laughs> well, in 2003, the European Parliament came in a report that pointed out that 7% of pressure groups in private were of the private sector and only 30% NGOs and civics. So if you're a unionist, you are on the 30% bit. But if you're a pharmaceutical company, you're on the 70% bit. And that's part of the point of networking and why you should be present, because a lot of things are happening. And they may be happening without you, if you're not organized. So yeah, organization is something that we don't like very much, but it's good when it happens. 2008, um, the EU created a registry of interest groups. So they said, OK, we acknowledge that we listen to lobbies because they have more resources to approach us. But at least you can see who these lobby groups are. They need to have this tag. And so do you. Uh, and so you have to go to this, through this process as well. Why bother? Why take an interest on, in the NGOs? One of the reasons is employment. The third sector creates employment. The other is social policy, including education. Um, we say we have become a knowledge society. Not all knowledge is in universities. I know you'll be surprised. Um, a lot of mainstream actions that have been ended up in an academic sector were developed by citizens' organization. Example. Or, or, in fact, a lot of the practices in public administration have been third sector work, NGO work that has been mainstreamed. <coughs> Example, cultural mediators. I am a migrant. I end up in the roads of Verona and I sleep in the street and suddenly I'm sick. I end up in the university. Uh, the doctor uh, comes to touch me and then I punch him because I think he's trying to do something with me. I, I come from a different cultural background. It has a different significance. And at some point, citizens or even doctors start to realize that we need to deal with this problem. So they start interviewing this person. They say, why did you hit me? They start to record this knowledge. Then people start getting organized. And then you have a practice of cultural mediation. And this is very valuable because then if you train people, a lot of doctors will not get punched. A lot of hours will be saved. And that costs money. So it makes sense to mainstream good practices. So, so the third sector knows a lot of stuff that is useful and of value. I mean, including financial value. Employment policy. OK, um, there are some, at some point, it was recognized that we have a lot of unemployment and that the sec third sector can do something about it because it could it responds to need by creating services and common action. And people, while doing that, at some point they create value. And this value can be valuable. And people are doing something. So we need to, to see whether we can uh, create employment on a self-sustainable basis. Um, so 1994, 1995, 1997, I won't go through the administrative stuff. but. There is a growing awareness. Uh, 
and the commission follows up and starts including NGOs in how they frame their bids. They might start really seriously saying, we've got to put some serious money into this. Because NGOs know things that are useful and of added value. And they are, at, well, if, if, if careful, they can be cost effective as well. Because not only they have know-how, but they have networks that the public administration cannot develop or pay for their development that can be exploited. So if you are doctors of the world and you work with the uninsured, how can the public administration even recognize its own failure, which, is, which are the uninsured? It's, it's better to pay somebody who's been dealing with this than pretend that you can deal with it. Plus, you can always say politically, well, I gave some money, so I'm um, okay. Um, so what? Well, already from the 90s you see that in Europe we are talking about a serious amount of people in the third sector. 8%. This has risen and risen and risen. 71% in NGOs, 26% in cooperatives, 2% in mutual funds. Then, now, um, now it's bigger. Not only it's big, it's bigger because employment gets less in traditional sectors, and it's bigger because te NGO. But we don't know how bigger it is because we will know the effect on the crisis on the third sector when the share results, well, the data comes out. Uh, but it won't take long. Uh, a few months, maybe. But it, it, it's, it's going to be interesting. <laughs> um, so structure of the market. Competing in the market with social values. So fair trade. Big in Britain. Um, but also in other countries. Filling public cups. So for example, ethical banks. There is such a thing talk about it later, <laughs> um, uh, funding people who no one else will, um, filling marginal markets, well I just described one, but there are other marginal markets, so um, and another marginal market is human rights teaching. Now if you advertise a course for that, I'm not sure many people will pay for it. But if you offer it, you may get a few people to get to be involved. But the NGOs, because they're civic organizations and they work on, they have to depend a lot on volunteers, and the employment they offer is not usually of the job for life insured, uh, properly insured kind of work. NGOs are not the best of employers. I mean, who is a good employer these days? That's another question. Um, so we start having inclusion in different policy levels. The European Social Fund, um, social exclusion, then we start even on structural funds uh, to, to have inbuilt components. So the, the money we're spending on Greece so that one day it will become um, like the West of Europe socially. We start building in components that should be spent on the third sector. And that can make sense and can't be a waste of money. It's a big discussion. Uh, it depends on how you do it, always. If you add into, the gender, into this gender gap a slashing of social benefits, which has happened recently in Greece, um, that also means they don't have a public place where they can go and, for 
luck of a better word, park the kids while they go to, to work or seek employment. Um, so these kinds of solutions will mushroom in Greece because it's a, it's a way for women very, who are likely to be more poor to sort of share um, between them this responsibility and become more employable. Why should I care the bigger picture? Okay, here's the academic bit coming in. <laughs> um, okay, you can't talk very much about the civic society without bringing Tocqueville at some point. Um, he was a, a French nobleman who went to America and was astonished on how differently things work there. Um, especially at those times, arguably in these times as well. Um, but basically he said that whenever people want to be heard in America, they form an organization. Uh, uh, that was a very American habit. And a lot of the theory about civic society and all this stuff does not come from the ancient Greeks or the Romans. It comes from <coughs> America. And um, yeah, that it actually started happening in the 19th century. And Tocqueville said another thing. It's they, they, um, they said in Europe, people get together. Um, well, in, in order to form a group to fight somebody, and uh, in in America, they, they form a group so they are they have a louder voice. And uh, so he was describing basically uh, because. His famous book, Democracy in America, he was describing something that was not happening in Europe. We did not have democracy in Europe. I mean, even the French, when they built it, they sort of gave it up for a while and then returned to it. <laughs> it kept working in the, in the United States for some time. Well, they did have slaves, though. So, um, there was another point. Um, the tyranny of a majority. Uh, now, if you are French and you've lived, uh, well, you've seen what the Jacobinian movement can do, go around, cut heads, and you, you, are, you are sort of afraid that at some point the majority is going to become tyrannical. And, and everybody takes turns in being a majority or a minority at different points in time. And so civic organizations were sort of an answer to that in the sense that it, def it defended you as a minority or your voice as a minority in critical times. Do I have some time? Okay. Um, coming back from the clouds. So the third sector becomes gigantic and the seventh is in the context of the crisis the retreat of the welfare state in the 80s, the decline of the, of the tax revenue in the 90s because the economy becomes global and people send their money to Cayman Islands and they can sort of pick and choose who has the smallest corporate tax and they go to places like Ireland and Cyprus and, and we stay. Um, and, and then there is this big movement called the third the third way to somewhere that has not as yet been specified from equality to equal opportunity, and um, yeah, and the whole growth of the pluralist literature about the separation of the elected and the appointed, and the balance of interest groups and public opinion. Basic, the basic idea is that if you have enough NGOs, then, like Tocqueville described, everyone will take turns in being a minority and a majority, and will be all harmoniously happy. But there is another reason why we like NGOs, that globalization has losers, so we stick together to see what we can do with them. It's a good crisis management mechanism. NGOs are good at my crisis management. That's why they even bring them in whenever there is a huge crisis in places like Afghanistan or the Balkans in the 90s. Sooner or later, an NGO will come because they know how. They grow through. They, People learn out of need. 
So you don't create an answer to a crisis unless you need it. And NGOs grow out of need as well. Like people working in Chernobyl, like Ukrainians getting together to work with Chernobyl victims in Chernobyl, like time banks mushrooming in the UK in the 1980s, that are now useful to us because we need them now because we have a similar crisis. Um, the state is retreating, volume of information, migration and capital flows, environmental challenges. No administration can deal with that. And um, we need know-how that has been developed over time on the basis of needs. To mainstream it is so cost-effective. Just, just uh, save a lot of money by doing that. Um, the private sector is gigantic. Um, you know, there are companies with a GDP that is ten times bigger uh, than, a, than a country um, and the, the issue is that the companies becoming bigger means less revenue for the state because the, the, you, it's, the bargaining has changed. You cannot force a company to give you money anymore because they will just move to another country. But I'll, that also means you have less money to redistribute. So somebody has to do what the state used to be doing. Um, so there are problems neither the state nor the private sector want to pick up or can't pick up. The private sector has also an incentive to give some money to the independent sector. Why? Um, customers, customer loyalty, buying security, boycotts can hurt them, it's a good brand name, um, and also support spending power. So if, if a society gets better, sooner or later, later it's good for profit as well, if the market gets better. There are criticisms towards NGOs um, that have been there since the 19th century. Some are Marxist, some are um, feminist, some are simply economic, substituting paid labor that deepens the crisis, some would argue. I won't go into that. Um, there have been generations of third sector growth, like we went from philanthropy to self-help communities to building commons globally. Um, what are commons? People who care about the environment have become a global network and they do things together. And if you look at how people organize, we went from big philanthropists, let's say a guy who was in Switzerland and built the Red Cross because he was passing outside a town where he saw victims being chopped off sometime in the 19th century. We went to global networks like Greenpeace or Sea Shepherds who sort of go to citizens, ask them for their money, and then they inform them of what they do with their money every year, and hopefully they'll...